Hello and welcome. In this video, we're gonna talk about the sine and cosine functions. We're gonna talk about what the basic graph looks like and how that can be modified with transformations and with adjustments to things like the period and the amplitude. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So let's actually start with what we know. We know about the unit circle. We know that every coordinate in the unit circle Every point on the unit circle is cosine of theta, comma, sine of theta, and we know that tangent of theta is sine of theta over cosine of theta. So using those pieces of information, can we basically make a table of points that we could use to plot theta sine theta? So let's look at sine first. Sine that's our y coordinates of each point. So go ahead and identify the y coordinates that are indicated in the table. So it says at zero, well at zero sine is zero. At pi over four, which I didn't need this middle one, so let's erase that. At pi over four, we're at root two over two. At pi over two, we're at one. At 3 pi over 4, we're at root 2 over 2. At pi, we're at 0. 5 pi over 4, negative root 2 over 2. 3 pi over 2, negative 1. 7 pi over 2, negative root 2 over 2. And back around at 2 pi is 0. So go ahead and fill in that table with cosine, meaning all of the x-coordinates of the points we just used, and then identify tangent by just dividing the sine over cosine. And the table is set up so that you can just think about that vertically. Sine divided by cosine will give you your tangent value. So go ahead and pause the video and work through that. So here I filled in that table using the x-coordinates for cosine and then dividing x over y to get our tangent values. So this DNE, remember, just stands for does not exist because I can't do one divided by zero. That doesn't exist. You could also put undefined here. Now, I could have used all of the points on the unit circle. I didn't use these points here. And I think we're gonna get a good enough shape. We're actually even gonna graph fewer of those points just to get an idea of what the shape of the graph looks like. So if we graph these points from zero, to 2 pi. Let's start with sine. So thinking about theta as our x coordinate and y equals sine of theta as our y coordinate, we're going to start with the point 0, 0. Then we're going to look at the point, the next axis here is pi over 2. So pi over 2 in our table is 1. Pi in our table is 0. 3 pi over 2 in our table is negative 1. And 2 pi is back to zero. So if we connect these dots, it's going to make a wave shape. It's called a sine wave. And I want you to do the best that you can to connect that, making a smooth curve. So here is the graph of sine, and it continues on. This is called one period of sine because it makes one sort of sideways looking S or one uphill and one downhill shape. That is one period of sine. So go ahead and pause the video and do the exact same thing for cosine. So your points should look like this, and when you connect it, make sure that you're making it look rounded. It sort of looks like this is just part of a piece of the sine graph, actually. So it should have a curvature to it. And there we have our cosine graph. Now, lastly, we're going to look at the tangent graph, and I'm going to work through this one with you because something sort of weird is going to happen when we look at these points. So we can plot the point 0, 0. We can plot the point pi over 4, which would be halfway between 0 and pi, pi over 4, 1. But then at pi over 2, it doesn't exist. So we're going to go ahead and sketch sort of a vertical asymptote there. And then we're going to look at the next two values. So 3 pi over 4, which would be halfway between pi over 2 and pi, is negative 1. And then pi is 0. And then 3 pi, 5 pi over 4 is 1. And then 3 pi over 2 doesn't exist. And then I'm going to do this just one more time. So 7 pi over 4 is negative 1. 2 pi 
is zero. I think you're getting the idea here. So now what happens when we connect these two graphs? What's gonna happen is they're gonna make almost like a cubic sort of shape and they're getting closer and closer. Well, that wasn't very curvy to each asymptote at the various pi over twos. So we're really not going to focus too much on tangent. I just like the idea of you seeing the graph for the first time so that you can get an idea of what the tangent graph looks like. It has all of these vertical asymptotes because there are places where sine over cosine doesn't exist. So now that we've talked a little bit about what the shape of the graph looks like and how we can pull those values from the unit circle, let's go ahead and talk about some of the key characteristics of the sine and cosine graphs. So here we have some key information on these graphs. And we actually already talked a little bit about the word period. A period is basically how long it takes the graph to complete one cycle. So you may want to make a note of that so you can see one period here on each graph. To find the period if you are given the function, so let's go ahead and kind of look at the generic forms of the functions here. So think of this in a transformation sense where you can see that plus D is sort of holding a space of an up or down transformation. The A value is a vertical stretch or a shrink. A C value is talking about a horizontal translation. And that B value would be talking about a horizontal stretch or shrink. So keep in mind everything we have learned before. We're not going to focus quite so heavily on the transformations right now, but it's just good to point them out here. So the amplitude A, or the amplitude is the absolute value of A. And what that really tells you is how high or how low the graph goes from the center. So one of the unique things about sine and cosine graphs is they have this sort of center line where everything is aligned. So I won't say symmetric, we couldn't fold it to be on top of each other, but that line helps us identify our symmetry or that line is the basis of us being able to identify other key features. So if you know where the center is, then you can use the absolute value of A to identify the amplitude, which is basically how high or how low the graph will go. Not to what Y value, but basically how tall each of those little hills are. From the function form, that can be found by just taking the absolute value of A. To calculate the period, to figure out how long it takes to complete one cycle, you would take two pi, which is the normal cycle, and you would divide it by B. That's gonna help you identify what the new period is in a modified sine or cosine function. Sine and cosine curves are gonna have a maximum and a minimum value, and you can see that on the graph, and that's gonna to relate to the center and the amplitude as well, but it's gonna have a highest value and a lowest value. And that's gonna be not the ordered pair, but the actual highest value, y, or lowest value, y, the output of the function. And those max and min values are gonna affect the range of the function. And the last thing I want to point out, which we'll focus on more when we actually start graphing these functions ourselves, our goal today is really just to be able to identify the key characteristics so that in the next lesson we can graph, is I want you to see that there are really five key points that we need to find in order to be able to connect our graph to get one cycle of the graph. As we saw with the unit circle, there are more points that we could obviously find in between each of these, but these five points, the main ones, let me erase those. Those five key points will give you the shape that you need to create a sine or cosine curve. So now that we've talked about these key characteristics, let's actually identify them from the graph for our sine and cosine graphs. So on the left here, we have our sine graph y equals sine of x. Our domain, now this I just want to point out, would keep going forever and ever. We just stopped to look at one cycle. So the domain would be everything. The range, what is the highest value it ever gets to and the lowest value it ever gets to, that's going to be 1 and negative 1. So the range is from negative 1 to 1. The amplitude is going to be the absolute value of A. Well, in this case, A is 1, so the absolute value of A is 1. 
the period is going to be 2 pi divided by b, and in this case, b is 1, so the period is 2 pi. And then we talked about our maximum being 1 and our minimum being negative 1. That's how we identified our range. And the endpoints we can see for this period that we're looking at are x equals 0 and x equals 2 pi. That's where we start and where we end. Go ahead and identify the same information for the cosine graph. Then unpause the video and see how you did. So hopefully you had time to do that. And here is that key information for the cosine graph pretty much the same as the sine graph. Really, it's just sort of a shift of the graph. If we kept going, we would see more of that same sort of shape. Now let's look at identifying these key characteristics from any equation, whether there's transformations, whether there's stretches or shrinks, being able to identify it given a function. Okay, so Let's talk about the amplitude first. Remember, to find the amplitude, you just have to take the absolute value of the A value. So in this case, for our example over here, the amplitude is going to be 1 fourth because 1 fourth, or the absolute value of 1 fourth, is 1 fourth. The center, or the midline, is going to be that vertical translation vertical translation. So here, and it's going to be written as a line. So the midline or the center, you can call it either, is going to be the line y equals 7. The period is going to be 2 pi divided by b, and in this case, in the b spot is 3, so the period is going to be 2 pi divided by 3. And then to find the endpoints, which is going to be really important when we're graphing, there's really two ways to do it. The first way to do it is that you can just take what's inside parentheses and set it equal to 0 and set it equal to 3 pi, sorry, to 2 pi, right? That's the normal cycle goes from 0 to 2 pi and solve each of those. So let's go ahead and do that. This is going to give me 3x equals pi over 2. So x is going to equal pi over 6. This is going to give me 3x equals Instead of writing 2 pi, I'm going to multiply 2 pi by 2 over 2 so I can have a common denominator. So that's going to be 4 pi over 2 plus the pi over 2 that I'm adding to both sides. So 3x equals 5 pi over 2. So x is going to equal 5 pi over 6. So the endpoints are going to be pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. So really, that's what I want you to focus on. What some people have noticed in the past that I just want to point out, and maybe this will work for you, is that if you find the first endpoint, you can just add the period to it to get the second endpoint. So you might find that to be a little easier. You might find it to be more complicated. I'm going to try and do it both ways. So depending on what you pick, you can get comfortable with that. So let's start with example one here. We're going to identify all four of those things, the amplitude, the center, the period, and the endpoints. So the amplitude, there's no number in the A spot, so the amplitude is just one. The center, there's no vertical translation here, so the center is going to be the line y equals zero. The period is going to be 2 pi over b, and in this case, b is 1 half, so 2 pi divided by 1 half, which means we have to flip and multiply, so the period is going to be 4 pi. And then lastly, let's find our endpoints, which I should have labeled that up here, endpoints. So we're going to set the inside equal to 0 and the inside equal to 2 pi. And then we're going to solve. So 1 half x equals negative pi over 4. Multiply both sides by 2. x equals negative pi over 2. And then over here, 1 half x equals, again, I'm going to rewrite this, 2 pi. I'm going to multiply by 4 over 4 to get 8 pi over 4 minus pi over 4. So 1 half x equals... 7 pi over 4, and then I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. That's going to give me 7 pi over 2. So let's go ahead and work through that process again on number 2. We're going to start with our amplitude. So if I identify my A, B, C, and D, which might be a helpful starting point for some of you, the absolute value of A is going to give me my amplitude, which is 2. 
Then my center is going to be y equals d, or in this case, y equals negative 1. Make sure you have y equals. That's what tells us that this is a line. My period is going to be 2 pi divided by b, which is 1. So the period is just going to be 2 pi. And then last but not least, we're going to calculate our endpoints. So I'm going to say x minus pi over 3 equals 0, and x minus pi over 3 equals 2 pi. If I add pi over 3 to both sides here, I get x equals pi over 3 is going to be where I would start. And then x equals 2 pi plus pi over 3. Now, if I multiply 2 pi by 3 over 3 so that I can have a common denominator, I'm going to get 6 pi over 3. 6 pi over 3 plus pi over 3 is going to give me 7 pi over 3. So here are my endpoints. So notationally, you can just write that the amplitude is 1 or that the amplitude is 2. Center has to be written as the equation of a horizontal line. Y equals that horizontal, I'm sorry, that vertical translation. Y equals 0. Y equals negative 1. The period, you can just write period and then write what the length of the period is. Ed, end points, you can just write as the x values that you find when you set the inside portion of your function equal to 0 and the inside portion of your function equal to 2 pi. So I'm going to encourage you to pause the video and work through number three, on, 3 and 4 on your own and then unpause the video and see how you did. All right, so amplitude on number 3 is the a value in front or the absolute value of the a value in front, which is going to be 3. Center is y equals 1. That's our vertical translation. The period is going to be 2 pi divided by 2, which is just pi. And the endpoints, when 2x is 0, is going to give me x equals 0 as one endpoint. 2x equals 2 pi is going to give me x equals pi as my other endpoint. Last but not least, on number 4, the absolute value of a, our amplitude is 1 half. Our center is y equals 0. Our period is 2 pi divided by 2, which is just pi. And our endpoints, 2x plus pi over 4 equals 0. So 2x equals negative pi over 4. And then if I divide both sides by 2, I'm going to get x equals negative pi over 8. Divide both sides by 2 or multiply both sides by 1 half. It's a little easier to see the fraction work there. For the second endpoint, I'm going to subtract pi over 4, which means I'm going to need some common denominator work. I'm going to multiply this by 4 over 4, so I get 8 pi over 4. So 2x is going to be 8 pi over 4 minus pi over 4 is 7 pi over 4. And then again, multiply both sides by 1 half or divide both sides by 2. That's going to give me my second endpoint is 7 pi over 8. So key ideas in this lesson, we first used the unit circle to identify points on the graph of sine and cosine and tangent. We used those points to look to sketch a graph of tangent so that we could see the basic shape of what the sine and cosine graphs looked like. We then identified the key features of those graphs, domain, range, the maximum, the minimum, the period, the amplitude, the center from the graph of those parent functions, and then we analyzed in more depth how to find each of those key factors, the amplitude, the center, the period, and the endpoints, if we are given a function by identifying our A, B, C, and D values from the transformation. Just like with other chapters, we could also be asked to identify what a transformation is, so we can use that up, right, left, down transformation, the different pieces of them. Or we could be asked to transform a function now that we know these new functions, sine and cosine. So go ahead and write down any questions you have, and I look forward to supporting you on this. Thanks for listening.